Okay, um, welcome to a talk. This talk's called um, Where Faith and Mental Health Meet. It's around helping churches create safe and supportive spaces for those that are struggling with emotional and mental health. And uh, all the teaching from today's um, talks, we've also done another talk for the um, Elam Leaders Summit called um, How to Lead When You're Not Okay. And I'm recording this at Elam Chomsford, Chomsford where God lives. And, uh, um, and like I said in the previous talk, it's a bit weird. I've spoken here many times, but never to myself. Um, so um, I hope to give you as much energy and passion as if this place was packed out. Um, if you need some resources, um, all the stuff that's been taken uh, from today's talks um, are from these books, um, Honesty Over Silence and When Faith Gets Shaken. And we've also got them on DVD for those of you who are not into uh, reading much. Um, so do check them out. And if you get them from the website, our website, kintsugihope.com, then all the proceeds go back into the charity, helping people um, with emotional and mental health challenges. So that would be really kind if you wanted to support in that particular way. Um, the books have bits of theology, bits of all sorts of stuff in it as well, um, which should be really relevant for today's session. Um, it's really interesting when you look at this topic around emotional and mental health. Um, Tim Keller said this quote recently, which I think is so, so interesting. It says this, there is a version of Christianity that many of us are brought into that has trained us to be professional pretenders. As people, we are ready to shatter the veneer of polished Christianity and step into vulnerability. The gospel requires, before the great work of grace can transpire in our lives, perhaps if we're all honest about those issues, honesty wouldn't feel so isolating. After all, Jesus didn't die for the image we project. Jesus died for who we really are. And so often, um, uh, we could be struggling, can't we? We could be laughing on the outside. It can all look incredible. I mean, this image, I think, is so powerful. And yet, on the uh, inside, we're really, really struggling. The outside looks great, but the inside is so different. At times, I've really struggled with emotional and mental health challenges. And I was really scared to tell anyone in church culture. And, uh, but anxiety was the lens I saw everything through. I don't know if you've ever done this. You get a headache and you go to Dr. Google for a diagnosis. And, uh, and suddenly it's a brain tumor, you know. And, uh, and I was really scared. And all the research, a lot of the research on anxiety says that anxiety's roots are often in the fear of death and the fear of people. And, and of course, that's huge at the moment, isn't it, with the, what's going on with the coronavirus. Some people are really wary. And I think this issue of anxiety is people, you know, don't want to go on the tube. They don't want to go on the bus. There is, there's these issues of getting back to work. These issues that are going on in our society and how we lead through that is going to be really, really, really important. Uh, fear of people. What do people think of me? Again, as a leader, that is really, really hard. Um, because there's this natural part of us that wants to be loved, that wants to be accepted. It's a human uh, instinct. And yet, that's why I think sometimes leaders can be really prone to issues of anxiety. So my personal story was I struggled with this, and there were times I, I even ended up in A&E because I was getting chest pains, but I didn't tell anyone. And when I did tell the odd person, when I was brave enough because it was getting a bit out of control, I was told the advice I got from church was pray a bit more. Or, you know, if you're going anxiety, you just need to trust God a little bit more, as if I'd never thought of that. And, and worse was, anxiety is a sin, and you've given the devil a foothold. And, uh, and I started to feel crushed and broken and going, is there anywhere in church that I can be honest here? Life is hurting for me. And uh, I remember I'd go forward for prayer sometimes, and, uh, and being, you know, People knowing who you are because you preach. Not that my job's more important than any other job. It really isn't. And, uh, but people, I guess, when you do this, know who you are. And, uh, and, you know, we do this stuff on TBN and written books and that. So their first thing was, without asking me how I was, would be like, Lord Jesus, we pray that pa you're humble, Patrick. I'm like, come on, guys. I'm smashed to pieces. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we pray for people and about these issues like it, it's a magic wand. And if people aren't healed instantly, we start to ask the question, why? And, uh, and so when it comes to these issues around emotional mental well-being, I think the first thing to say is we've got to accept where people are at and not where we want them to be. Acceptance is the first place of healing. One of the things that really helped me is I read this blog 
online by Blurt. Um, they're an amazing organization. And the most common thing I hear from people that are su- struggling with depression is it's somehow their fault. And, uh, and this was 10 lies that depression tells us. Number one, depression tries to convince us we're not actually ill. Depression tells us everything is our fault. Depression tells us nobody cares about us or likes us. Depression tells us we're not good enough. Depression tells us we don't deserve things. Depression tells us we're a bad person. Depression tells us be quiet. Depression tells us you're a burden. Depression tells us we don't deserve help and support. Depression uh, tells us there is no hope. The challenge is we keep looking for a quick fix instead of committing ourselves to the process of healing. Now the challenge is this, is we all have mental health the same way we have physical health. Now this slide that hopefully is appearing on your screen talks about the difference between supporting someone with mental illness versus physical illness. And we need to realize that actually mental illness and mental health are two very different things. And we need to break the stigma that is involved when looking at this in the church. Wherever there was stigma, that's where Jesus was. Another slide. Some disabilities look like this, and others look like this. You can't always tell what people are going through. I want to show a video now. Um, this is from my really good friends at the Mind and Soul Foundation. Um, and uh, uh, Rob, Will and Kate, they're just amazing people. And uh, they put this video together with some friends and uh, describes about what it's like when you need to pray for someone. Check this out. This is Joe. He experiences periods of painful anxiety and depression. Imagine Joe's mind is a house. That's right, a house. What did you do to your house? Put that hammer down. We're going to pray for you. Absolutely. Stand in a place of faith, Joe. Do you believe God can fix your house right now? Dear Lord, forgive Joe for not building his house on the rock. Mm, Give Joe the faith to know his roof is already fixed. He just needs to bring his will into alignment with the truth. Yes, Lord. And we rebuke the spirit of darkness that is inside that house right now. Amen. This is a spiritual problem, Joe. It cannot be fixed with simple, practical solutions. Other people can't help you, Joe. This is your problem. Besides, what would people think of you if they saw your house in this sort of a state? Cheer up. You've just got to have more faith. Like Joe, many people struggle with anxiety and depression. How could you pray for them so that they feel loved and valued and able to access further help? Really helpful video there and really challenging as well. Now, um, a lot of people would have heard of Mental Health First Aid. Mental Health First Aid is a brilliant course. I can't recommend it highly enough for churches to go and do to get a greater understanding. Again, it's not counselling, it's mental health, well-being. And, uh, and they talk about um, the mental health continuum, which I think is a really helpful way of helping us understand this. It'll be coming up on your screen. As you see in the middle, there is stigma. And, uh, and it says that on this continuum, um, basically traditional mental health is at the top. That is maximum mental well-being and uh, fitness. At the bottom, you've got mental, um, minimum mental well-being and fitness, mental illness. And they're saying what happens is we move around this continuum. So actually, to understand mental health is actually to look at these different sections and the movement between them. And, uh, and so you could have a person that has a diagnosis of serious um, mental illness, but actually copes well and has positive mental health. 
And, uh, and I think I've probably been in that place and probably in that place to a certain extent, that anxiety and depression have been a part of my life, but through management, through understanding what's going on, through exercise, through friendship, actually I <laughs> do okay at the moment, though it's always a challenge and I need to keep up at those sort of things. And, uh, and you can see that right down in the bottom corner, you can get n uh, no diagnosis or disorder and you can have poor mental health. And actually where you want is you want to get people moving up towards that. And the challenge is, is that we move around this quite a lot. We exist on the axis and we can move around them. The, the horizontal axis is often where people fit medical language. The vertical axis is the place for social language. But the challenge is, wherever we are on that mental health continuum, and again, look at the mental health first aid stuff, there's so much great stuff on there, is that we want to be able to support people in having the best mental health, the best well-being that is possible. And the thing that often is the challenge is stigma. Stigma is the barrier that stops people seeking support from moving around these different sections. Rick Warren said this, it's not a sin to be sick. Your illness is not your identity and your chemistry not your character. Everything is broken in the world because of sin. So why is it then, if my liver doesn't work perfectly, I take a pill for that and there's no shame in that. If my heart doesn't work perfectly, I take a pill for that and there's no shame in that. If my lungs don't work perfectly, I take a pill for that and there's no shame in that. So why is it then, if my brain doesn't work perfectly and I take a pill for that, I'm supposed to hide that? We have to challenge stigma at every single level. Now, if you look at any website about well-being, as you'll see, there are five well-established paths to well-being that most people talk about. Um, number one, they talk about connecting, connecting with others. Number two, they talk about being active, exercise. Uh, uh, number three, taking notice, taking notice of your thoughts, taking notice of what's going on around you. Don't just go on autopilot. Um, keep learning, number four. Number five, um, give. Kindness is always the best drug. And I wanted to talk about all of these, but the one I really want to focus on, because I want to do something well rather than just give you massive lists, which is the temptation when it comes to talks like this, is the one that's most relevant, I guess, well, they're all relevant for church, but number one, connection. It's hard to connect to people who are not honest. I've said in my previous talk that the role of lament in this season of the church is so important. You know, 40% of the psalms are laments. 40% of our worship songs are not lament. The reality is you cannot forgive someone properly if you haven't learned to lament. We need to stop pretending. We need to show kindness to ourselves and to others. In Kintsugi Hope, we talk about holding space for people. And what does that mean? Um, this is one of my favorite quotes ever. It says this, to hold space for someone. It means that we're willing to walk alongside another person in whatever journey they're on without judging them, making them feel inadequate, trying to fix them, or trying to impact the outcome. When we hold space for other people, we open our hearts, offer unconditional support, and let go of judgment and control. So often we've told people that the reason they're struggling is because it's their sin or it's their lack of faith. We, we want to answer the why question. I'm reminded of when um, the uh, people came to Jesus and saying, you know, why is this guy blind? Is it because he sinned or his ancestors have sinned? And I think the message version says, you know what, there's no cause and effect here. You're asking the wrong question. I've had people come up to me and say in tears going, um, I think I'm depressed and I went up to my pastor and uh, I explained all what was going on. I've been crying every day. And my pastor said, um, I hear no faith in your comments whatsoever. And, and I said to her, you know, I am not an expert. I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm a practitioner. I'm a communicator. But I, I, I am not, I'm not an expert. I've never claimed to be an expert. But in terms of well-being, I think you should go and talk to your GP or talk to someone and explain what's going on. And it was almost like, Really? And I don't think medication is the answer to everything. Um, it often helps to get us up to a phase where then we can cope with actually dealing with some of the root causes. But for some people, it is. For other people, it's hard to get it right. But you know what? There's no shame in going to a doctor going, I'm not doing incredibly well at the moment and I need some help. Um, it's part of a whole range of support that you can get. We need to listen, to come alongside 
Um, and the church has such an important role to play. You know, I heard someone say this, and I think it's so true. If someone's got cancer, we would expect the professionals to deal with chemo and radiotherapy and all the medical stuff that we need them to do, and we want to support our medical professionals in that. We do not want to pretend that we can do what they can do. But you know what? Um, if someone's got cancer, as well as the chemo, they need the love, they need the support, they need the community around them. And that's why the church is in an amazing position. You know, the two biggest issues of our time before the coronavirus was um, by studies by livability and others, they described them as mental health and loneliness. I read a report on the BBC yesterday that said that well-being in this country is, is the lowest it's ever been since 2011. And anxiety and poverty, they're saying, are going to be some of the two biggest issues coming out of the coronavirus. But the church, the church is in every community across this country. It's there for the long haul. It exists for its non-members. And the thing about church is when people like in the government, other people go to me, yeah, but actually, you know, as long as you don't mention Jesus, it's okay. Well, I say, do you know what? The thing is, if you look at the research, there's an internal transformation that happens when someone realizes that they're loved that someone died for them, that they cared for them. There's something that happens. That's why often Christian rehabs and other places, they're just staggering at the way they help people across the world. The church needs to discover its prophetic edge again. Walter Brigham, the Old Testament scholar, says this, a, the, a role of the prophetic uh, is twofold, to evoke grief and create amazement. Grief for what has been lost, amazement for the new worlds that are possible. What a brilliant quote for today. Evoke grief. We need to lament. We need to grieve. But we need to say, you know, within that, hope is still possible. Loneliness is a killer. Being acutely lonely is as stressful as being punched in the face by a stranger and massively increases your risk of depression. The effects of loneliness is the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Three quarters of GPs before the coronavirus said they were seeing between one and five lonely people today. Rediscovering what community is. Rediscovering what it really is to love people and come alongside them. I want you to watch this uh, video. This is actually my favorite video um, by the uh, brilliant Brené Brown talking about the difference between sympathy and empathy. Check this out. So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us, that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. 
Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. We have a Messiah who walks alongside us, and we need to walk alongside others as well. I love this quote. When someone is broken, don't try and fix them. You can't. When someone is hurting, don't attempt to take away their pain. You can't. Instead, love them by walking beside them in their hurt. You can. Because sometimes when people need is simply to know they're not alone. I've done another talk, um, which you probably find a line somewhere, called I'm Journeying with, uh, with Others Through a Crisis. And in that, I really unpack the story of the Emmaus Road, where Jesus walks alongside these two heartbroken, disillusioned, um, all their dreams gone. And the way he dealt with them, it was just beautiful. There's so much that we can learn about journeying with others through a crisis from that story. My story is... Um, I ran a charity for 22 years. I founded it, um, gave my life to it in many ways, um, sacrificed quite a lot, and my family as well. And then it got to 21 years old, and, uh, and I really felt God say, it's time to let it go. And I'm like, hey, hang on a minute, I'm a founder, we don't let go. And, uh, and we really um, prayed about it and realized that God was breaking our heart for different things. And to be honest, I think I had to unlearn lots of things that I had picked up over the years in Christian culture. I had to learn about self-compassion, um, that self-compassion, self-indulgence, two different things. Self-compassion, talking to yourself the way you talk to your best friend. Because um, I was my own biggest critic. I learned about mindfulness, and uh, not in some weird sort of Buddhist uh, thing, but realizing that prayer and being present to God is actually the best thing about mindfulness. Um, take prayer out of mindfulness, it, you lose what's really good about it. And uh, perfectionism, stigma, shame, guilt, gratitude, resilience. I started to rethink all this stuff and, and put most of my thoughts down in the books. But me and Diane, we decided that God was calling us into this area of well-being and uh, to promote positive emotional and mental health. And, uh, and you know, they say that vision is the art of seeing the invisible that produces passion and energy in people. That's why Jim Wallace says Martin Luther King stood up and he didn't say in Washington in front of a quarter of a million people, I've got a complaint to make, or I'd like you to read my five-year business plan. Or please come to an AGM and we're going to talk about vision, um, which all is code for this might be the most boring meeting you ever come to. But actually, I'm not just joking, please hear me there. But you know, the fact is, is vision is the art of seeing the invisible that produces passion and energy in people. And so we started to dream. We started to dream of a world where mental and emotional health is understood and accepted with safe and supportive communities for people to grow and flourish. And the key with this was, it wasn't just a clever load of words. It was like we realize that when you feel understood and accepted and you feel safe and supported, think about it. When you feel safe and supported, you will grow and flourish. And so we started to look at what we can do. And we realized that the royals... Uh, had done a brilliant job at raising awareness on mental health. Mental health has been, uh, the issues around uh, well-being have been talked about more than they've ever been before. But we realise that a lot of people are going, you know what, what now? Um, I need some support, I need some help, and there's a two-year waiting list at the doctors. And, and we realise that also there were some other amazing organisations out there that were experts. And, uh, and so what we really wanted to focus on was this whole area of well-being, how do we connect, how do we support each other, and, um, and we looked at all the other charities who are amazing, you know, Renewed Wellbeing, do a great job, Ruth Rice, good friend of ours, Mind and Soul, Mercy UK, Think Twice, CWR, Livability, um, and I'm sure, you know, the Association of Christian Counselors, they do some amazing stuff, and we realised that actually these guys are brilliant. But I guess what we were really asking God was, we don't want to start another charity. Um, to be honest with you, I didn't want to start a charity at all because I don't want to fundraise ever again in my life. And, uh, but what we wanted to do was start a movement. And we looked at movements across the country. We looked at Alcoholics Anonymous, which is an amazing uh, program that has gone around the world. We looked at Weight Watchers. We looked at Park Run. I don't know if you've ever heard of Park Run. For those of you who don't know Park Run, it's when people run in parks. Well, they used to. Um, we looked at Weight Watchers. We looked at all these different things. And something about when you can belong, but you don't have to fit in. Something about coming together and realizing that you are not on your own. And so what we did is we started Kintsugi Hope. 
And uh, kintsugi is a Japanese word that means golden joinery. If you take a bowl and you break it, you make it with super glue, you hide the cracks. What they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue, so instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. Arguably, the object becomes more beautiful than it was before. It certainly becomes more unique. So we did a 12-step program, a bit like Alcoholics Anonymous, but for well-being. And it wasn't for people that got serious mental health diagnosis, um, and uh, it was more for people, for all of us, who want to invest in our well-being, who want to take serious our, our mental health as well as our physical health. And we looked at 12 different topics. We looked at anger, we looked at um, uh, self-acceptance, resilience, anxiety, stigma, honesty. And uh, we wrote it in learning styles, which was amazing because everyone learns differently. Um, and so we wrote it in seven different learning styles. We, we use prayer as a learning style. And we said there's three things that we want to achieve in this course. Number one is self-management tools to teach people stuff that's hopefully going to help them in their lives. Second is peer-facilitated mentoring, support around you. And thirdly, signposting to additional help from the experts where it's needed. I was like, how on earth are we going to get this? You know, now um, when I started XLP, I was living on an estate somewhere. I'm not so bad. Now I've got four kids and a mortgage. I'm not so keen on this. And then we were like, you know, the church. The church have small groups. So instead of us reinventing something where uh, if you're a leader, you're already exhausted, right? And you just don't want to be sold one more thing to do. And uh, why don't we just say, you've got small groups? Why don't you do this for 12 weeks? And what happened was just incredible. Um, we did it in our small group and... Uh, Obviously, before lockdown, our small group went um, trebled in size. <laughs> and I remember that on the first week, we were talking about honesty. And Diane was leading it. I was just the annoying assistant leader. And she said, turn to the person beside you and talk about a high point in your life and a low point in your life. And I thought, well, oh, this is easy. And I turned to the guy that I'd been in this church with for most of my life. And uh, he's brilliant. And, and he started telling me his story. And I realized I learned more in five minutes than I'd learned in all years of being in church, um, doing this on a Sunday. Because we started to have the honest conversation and, and now our relationship is so different. And, uh, and then we got to the week on forgiveness and, uh, and a lot of the people in our group were, were people in the community, you know, people that we'd invited, uh, friends, people who go to the kids' school, because um, they were all interested in this whole area of well-being. And, uh, and the interesting thing is, we got to the week on forgiveness, and uh, one of them said, oh, you Christians, you have to forgive everyone, don't you? Can you explain that to the rest of the group, please? I looked at my wife at that point and went, yeah, you know, I've been wondering about that as well. And uh, she sort of looked at me like in shock. And we had this amazing conversation on forgiveness. Every week we talked about spirituality because we talked about how we cope with anger, how we cope with anxiety, how we cope. We weren't trying to slip in the gospel. We were talking about life. And if spirituality doesn't affect the whole of our lives, then there probably is something wrong. It was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. We use um, prayer as a, a learning style. Like I said, we produce this journal um, called This Is Me and uh, give this out. And it's got um, Bible verses in it and it's got inspirational quotes in it. And we did that because often journaling is so good for your emotional mental health. Um, but sometimes when I pick up my journal, um, I'm in a bit of a negative mood. So I thought if I came up with positive things on every other page, I could come up with the positive quotes for you. And, uh, and people have been buying this like you wouldn't believe um, around uh, this time of social distancing and lockdown because it's really, really good for you. So you can get that off our website if, you're, if that's helpful for you. Um, suddenly, I was doing a talk at a festival which was packed out and anxiety. I said, anyone want to run a pilot? I mean, 11 pilots started across the country. They started running in homeless hostels. And they started, and people started saying, well, we could do this for the deaf community. We could do this for people in our community that suffer from postnatal depression. We could do this um, in the farming community. The farming community have huge um, rates of um, completed suicides. Um, lonely, desperate. Um, people start saying, well, it could happen in schools and in prisons. And suddenly it was like, bang! A movement has started. We trained very quickly 186 leaders from 70 different churches. Um, and when the lockdown happened, we thought, oh my goodness, this is it. It's ruined. And, uh, and then Zoom came along. I'd never even heard of Zoom. I didn't know what Zoom was. Sounds weird. Um, and, and to be honest, if I'm really honest, I've written a book called On the Sea of Silence, um, it doesn't quite do it for me in the way it's doing it for some other leaders. <laughs> but actually, it's the best we've got. And groups did move on Zoom, and all our training did move on Zoom. And now anyone from across 
the country, in fact, we've even got groups and pilots in it in Australia, um, are starting to run Kintsugi well-being groups on Zoom. And they're getting loads of non-Christians coming along because they're going to, you know, all these WhatsApp groups. I don't know if you heard of the free up, free down on WhatsApp where you look after the free neighbours that way and free neighbours that way. Saying to them, look, we're doing this thing online about well-being, self-management tools and support. Fancy it? Loads of people are coming on it. Um, if I'm honest, we're exhausted. We're exhausted because um, it's just gone crazy. But we started this a couple of years ago, and, uh, and it feels like for a time such as this um, that it's so, so important. And I have, like many people, have been praying for a big move of God's Spirit. But I've been saying to God, God, you know what? If the next big move of your Spirit comes in some massive warehouse with thousands of people in it, with a massive worship band, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Christian TV are going to come along and they're going to beam it around the world and we're going to call it revival, I think I might quit. But I was saying to God, if it could start in businesses and coffee shops and pubs and hospitals and homeless hostels and prisons and schools, and if it isn't led by the great and the famous and the good and the charismatic, but by the fragile, the humble and the courageous, then you know what? I'm up for it. And it feels like through this time, and I'm not saying God's caused this time at all, I just not but things have been stripped away. And suddenly people are realizing, you know what, the most important thing we have is relationship, is community, is connection. And it's beautiful what's going on. Uh, my favorite verse um, in the Bible at the moment is this, Proverbs 11, verse 21. Anyone can find the dirt in someone. Be the one that finds the gold. And, uh, and so here's our map of churches. This is completely out of date. And, uh, but it's happening. A movement's starting to happen. Some people go to me, when do we preach at them? <laughs> And I was like, um, you know what? On the first week, my wife died, and she talked about honesty. And she talked about the fact that uh, her honest, honestly, her hardest moment in her life is when she had a miscarriage. She was dreaming of having this kid. Um, and it all went pear-shaped. And she said, I nearly lost my faith, but my faith was the thing that got me through. And we had the most beautiful discussion with all these people about faith and redemption and suffering and all that stuff. And it just happened week by week by week. Brokenness reveals who Jesus is. I believe that the gospel, actually, we've made the gospel small. We've said that the gospel is personal salvation only. Personal salvation is amazing. But you know what? If we think the Jesus narrative is no more than answering the question, how do we get to heaven? Then we've got nothing to say until the person answers that question. But what if the story is wider? What if the gospel has something to say to questions like, uh, my friends died of coronavirus. How do I cope? I've been a victim of child abuse. How do I cope? I'm struggling parenting my teenage kids. I feel guilty all the time because I don't have the time to work and I don't have the time to give my children and my husband is getting fed up because um, we never spend any time together. Maybe God has got something to say as we dive into those questions and wrestle with Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. You know, the reality is this. The gospel is the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus. It's got something to say to politics, to business, to healthcare, um, to the arts, to education. We cannot go and just do this stuff in the same old way. We want to see a revolution of values that put people before programs, that put um, character before charisma, that put kindness before achievement. That's what we're longing to see, a place where people recognize that they're loved by a loving God. I want you to watch this little video now. It's about 30 seconds, and it's in German. Sorry about that. But what it is, is of a granddad um, whose granddaughter has bought him an iPad. And, uh, and you can see how he reacts to it. Check it out. So the reality is, is you can use an iPad for that. You really can. But if you do, you're missing out on all the things that an iPad can do. And sometimes I think we're missing out because we've got a small vision of what the gospel is. It's incredible. It can transform society. And uh, uh, Maya, Maya Angelou, she says this, and I think this is so true. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. 
And so as we grappled with this faith meeting, emotional mental health, and we've talked about being non-judgmental, we've talked about not trying to fix people, we've talked about creating safe and supportive communities, we've talked about trying to understand, to walk alongside people in their pain, to realize that we all have mental health the way we have physical health. To ask those questions is so important, to realize that we're all on the mental health continuum, and to realize that the church is in every community across this country. And as we've grappled with all these things, I want us to be passionate that hope is there. Grass is growing through the cracks. I want to finish with uh, probably my favorite ever um, poem. And uh, um, this poem is based on a text scrawled on the cellar wall in Cologne in Germany in 1943. It's believed to be written by a child hiding from the Nazis. And it says this, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. And I believe in love even when there's no one there. And I believe in God even when he's silent. And I believe through any trial there's always a way. But sometimes in this suffering and hopeless despair, my heart cries for shelter to know someone's there. But a voice raises within me saying, hold on my child. I'll give you hope. I'll give you strength. Just stay a while. I'm going to pray for you. It's been such a privilege for me um, to be part of Elam and to be part of this um, summit for leaders, um, and I'd uh, be really praying for you guys as you grapple with how, you, uh, how we lead out of this, how we lead well, how we lead with courage and vulnerability. And, and do get in touch with Kintsugi Hope, um, the website, uh, www.kintsugihope.com, if we can help and support you running well-being groups um, or getting hold of some of the resources. Um, they're there. We want to try and be as generous as possible at this time. Father God, thank you for everyone that's listened to this, Lord. And, uh, and I know we just scratched the surface, but God, I pray that you would inspire us again um, for more honesty, more vulnerability, but in a safe place. Lord God, we do not claim to be experts in anything, but God, we know that your love can reach um, the hardest of hearts. And we pray that your spirit would move in the name of Jesus across our communities, across our healthcare systems, across our education systems, our prisons, Lord, where people are scared. Um, with our young people and our children, with our old people in the care homes who um, feel forgotten. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would move by your spirit. Amen. Amen.